Beloved, how to choose a church. Which church is the true church? I say a thing like that and someone bristles and says, oh, he's just going to say, his church is it. No, I'm not. Got too much class for that. <laughs> what I intend to do is lead you into a simple Bible study. How to choose a church? A question like that could be quite baffling. Some years ago I read there were more than 300 legitimate Christian denominations in this country, another 200 independent cults, sects, and so forth. The figure has changed grossly. I heard Pastor Lemon say he read a report of about 1,200. And then I saw another statistic today. Over 1,100 different churches all claiming to belong to one Jesus. Now you add to that thousands of other religions. It could be confusing. What to do? Logical questions because here is where people get deceived. Are they all right? Think about it. Most of them are part right and part wrong. And don't forget what I'm about to tell you. Deception is a commingling of truth and error. Error by itself doesn't deceive anybody. Suppose I got a bottle of poison labeled clearly poison. This stuff will kill you. And I handed it to you and said, drink this. Would you drink it? Of course not. But suppose I took an appealing glass of orange juice and then took that same poison and put a little bit in there. And now I say to you, have some orange juice. Isn't there the possibility that you'd drink it? Deception then is a commingling of truth and error. Part right and part wrong can become the most dangerous concoction in religion that you could possibly approach. Part right, part wrong. The truth is that most people don't know why they belong to the church they belong to. And if they give you reasons, they give you invalid reasons. Back in the days when an insurance man came to my house, he and I were having a discussion one day, and I mentioned that most people don't know why they belong. He said, you know, Pastor, when I think of it, I don't know why I belong to my church. He said, I go there because they have a good choir. Devil used to be the choir leader. Trouble got started in the choir up in heaven. Now, I like a good choir. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are those who go to a church because it's near their house. Is that a good reason? Go ahead and answer me. Is that a good reason? Some go because that's where my wife goes and I just want to be with her. Or vice versa. You ought to have good reasons for belonging to a church. It ought to be more than just my mother and my father and my grandmother went here. The Bible says be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to me preach, some of you quite regularly. And you have heard some very challenging things from this pulpit. Things that perhaps you never heard before. And I want to tell you right now, and I thank God for this, everything that I teach is based on the unquestionable authority of God's Word. And if it's not there, you don't have to pay it any attention. Now, if you want to know why I keep the Sabbath, ask me. You want to know why I don't smoke cigarettes? Ask me. 
Want to know why I don't drink liquor? Ask me. Want to know why I don't run to these wild theaters? Ask me, and I'll give it to you from here. If you don't believe it, ask me. Dear ones, you ought to know why you go to church where you go. And remember, deception is a commingling of right and wrong. And Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. Christ and Satan are not partners in anything, most of all in religious activities. Okay, does Jesus have a church? I submit that he does. On one occasion, he went to the Jewish temple and he found the money changers and he drove them out and he said, ye shall not make my father's house a den of thieves. That was his church. One of his great, 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 great grandparents built the thing. His name was Solomon. He had every reason to be sentimentally attached. But later on, when they refused truth and turned against him and conspired to kill him, Jesus sat on the side of the mountain and looked back at the temple with its white marble and its golden spires gleaming in the light of the eastern sun. And Jesus uttered a soliloquy greater than Hamlet's. And in a voice of unspeakable sadness, Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens, but you would not. Therefore, your house. Is left under you desolate. No longer my house. Well, was he then without a house? In Matthew 16 and verse 18, after Peter's great confession, Jesus said, uh, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, did reveal this unto you. I say unto you, thou art Peter, Petros, but upon this Petra, this solid rock of your confession, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I'm reviewing something I gave you the other day because I want you to connect now. Jesus has now rejected the tabernacle or the temple. He said, it's your house, but I've got one. Mine is founded on the solid rock of Peter's confession, not Peter, but of what he said, that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the cornerstone. The church is built upon Jesus. He is the head. We are the body. Christ built the church and then guaranteed its survivability. He said the gates of hell. In the Greek, that's not the word Sheol or Tartarus. It is the word Hades, which means the grave. Jesus said they are going to persecute my church. They're going to try to kill it out. But I'm telling you, the grave shall not enfold my church. The church will live. And the devil tried his best to step it out. But Josephus and Gibbon both agreed that persecution only lengthened the boundaries of the church. Gibbon said every time they killed one, ten would join. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Well, I wonder why that was so. Because Christians taught folk how to die. Now, we put a lot of emphasis on teaching people how to live. And that's very important. But it's also important to know how to die. My mother was going to sleep in Jesus. She was smiling. Her face was radiant. You could tell that she was very sick. But she was radiant. Hope filled her eyes, her face. And when she could no longer speak, she caught my brother's hand, the one that's here with me, and my dad's hand, and joined them across her bed and simply pointed up. you got to show people how to die. I hope he won't mind me telling you this, but my brother's dear wife, first wife, died of cancer. A registered nurse waiting on all kinds of people and suddenly came down. And her life, it was short after that. And we lived down in Maryland and they were way up in Pennsylvania. And my wife and I got in the car one Sabbath morning and we were going to spend the day with her. And frankly, I was wondering, how, what shall I say? I'm not good at this. And when I went into her room, I saw that radiance too. I saw the ravaging that cancer had done on her. But her face was radiant. Her eyes were radiant. 
And so we didn't talk about her condition. She was lifting us up. And we stayed by the hour. And finally, toward evening, it became necessary for us to go back home. And she rose up in that bed. And she reached out those bony hands. And she took mine and my wife's. And she looked at us with resolution. And she said, now listen, you two. I might not see you anymore down here. But I'm going to look for you in God's kingdom. When they burned those Christians at stake, when they fed them to lions, they felt the lion's gory mane, the tyrants brandished steel, and the galleries were full of pagans who watched Christians die. And the one thing the pagan feared was death. They didn't know what to expect. And here are Christians dying, singing songs of praise. They were teaching them how to die. And when the affair was over, pagans went around quietly to Christian homes and says, Why is it you folk die like that? And they answered, Because there is one who has been there. And he rose up from the dead. And he said he's got the keys to death and hell. And if we die, we will live again because he lives. Would you say amen? amen. They said, Look, I want a piece of that. And they started joining the church. And they joined so fast. That Emperor Diocletian gave up on it. And the legions of Constantine rode through the empire declaring amnesty for Christians. Stop killing them. They're multiplying too fast. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And that is a possessive singular pronoun. My. It's mine. Now listen to the word of the Lord. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord. How many? One, one faith. How many? One. Come on. How many? One. one faith, one baptism. In John 10, 16, Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. I got sheep everywhere. He's got sheep out there in the gutter. He's got sheep in jail. That's why he said to the disciples, and they wrote it down, I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus has sheep that are running wild right now. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. But that isn't where the text ends. It goes on to say, them also I must bring and there shall be one fold. How many? One, one fold and one shepherd. That's Jesus' word. St. Paul said in Philippians 2, 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Everybody say amen. amen. In Acts chapter 2, everybody likes to talk about the Holy Ghost coming down. The Bible says, uh, when Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place, of one accord. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that oneness amongst Christians is stressed. Jesus didn't say, upon this rock I build my 1100 plus churches. He said, I build my church. My is singular and church is singular. I've got one fold. One shepherd, one Lord. And now I want you to think alike and I want you to act alike. I want you to dress alike. I want you to eat alike. I want you to walk alike. I want you to talk alike. Christians everywhere should be alike. And the Bible says so. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in 2 John and verse 10, there's only one chapter. If there come any and bring not this doctrine... Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Now, beloved, I want to be fair with everybody. And I was a stranger to you until I got here. And I told you, don't just sit there and take everything I say. That's why we got 1,100 plus churches. I told you when I give a spiritual proposition, I must give you a scripture, and I told you to write it down, didn't I? And go home, and if it's not in the Bible, I'm a liar, and if I were you, I wouldn't come back. Now, I'm being fair. If I treat myself like that, you know I hold every other preacher to that standard. 
I'm not going to accept anything from anybody that cannot bear the stamp of Scripture. My soul is at stake. More than friendship, more than the fact that I like somebody, my soul is at stake. Therefore, as God gives me light through the Holy Ghost, I've got to know that what I believe is founded upon Scripture. And the Bible says, if somebody comes to your house and doesn't bring this truth, don't receive him, neither bid him God's speed. Let me quote on. It says, for he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deed. You read it, 2 John 10. Wait a minute, wait a minute, how to apply this? You don't have a lot of visiting preachers anymore. How does he come to my house and bring not this doctrine? On television. On family radio. If he comes into my house and he contradicts God's word, I'm cutting him off. I don't waste my time listening to false prophets. I will listen to men who are good morally. I will listen to men who are giving a good lesson. But the minute they tell me I don't have to obey God, the minute they tell me the law is nailed to the cross, the minute they tell me that the first day of the week is the Sabbath, I cut them off because they are contrary, not to my denomination, but to the word of God. Now the text says, don't let them come in your house and don't bid them God's speed. That means don't pray for them and don't send them your offerings. Because if you do that, you're supporting them and you're supporting the error they teach. And you are a partaker of the, now I know this is strong, but Lord in heaven knows it's time for strong messages. Time to stop playing games. And the Bible says, Romans 16, 17, write it down. The Bible says, mark them that cause division among you and avoid them. Now that's clear. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul said, I want you to speak the same thing, that there be no division amongst you. A Christian church following Christ, 1,100 different kinds. I've said it once, I say it again right now, and if you have a logical, reasonable, rational, intelligent mind, you will be bound to agree. I'm not telling anybody to follow me. I'm saying that if all Christians everywhere got their religion out of this book and this book only, we would be one church. We would be believing the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, God has a church. One church, one doctrine among hundreds. And I suppose you're looking at your watches and you're saying, if he's going to cover 1,100 churches, I don't fight churches. My message is not negative, it's positive. And this thing narrows down so fast it'll make your head swim. I don't have to go through all those 1,100 different ideas. Listen to what the Bible says. Matthew 7, 20. By their fruits shall you know them, not by their name. Got a letter one time and said, look, the very name of my church indicates that it's the true church. Because it's called the church of God. My answer was, as I was coming to this meeting, I passed a beer joint called Paradise. <laughs> the Bible says, by their Fruits shall you know them. What do they stand for? You can't even judge by the members because they're hypocrites in all churches. You can't judge the master's vineyard by a few sour grapes. So how do you judge? You must look for its teachings, what it stands for, and always you'll find somebody living up to that. But you don't look at people, you look at their teachings and what they stand for. And if they are in harmony with the word of God, you've found it. If they are not, you've not found it. Let us go on. Matthew 15, I want you to look at this. You don't have to turn there, I'll turn. You write it down. Matthew 15 and verse 1. 
the Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Tradition. Your disciples are offending us. We've got traditions. They don't wash their hands when they eat. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Words of Christ written in red. So what's most important, the commandments of God or tradition? And then when you go down a little further in the same scripture, verses 8 and 9, Jesus said, Jesus said, this people. Now, please pray. And I'm not a bitter preacher. I have this way of talking. And sometimes I say, Lord, don't let the rough edges of my personality offend anybody. Because that's not what I feel in my heart. I'm reading to you the words of Christ written in red. Matthew 15, 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. They can praise and say beautiful things. You get a lot of spiritual sound bites. Clever little nice things. And they can call my name. They, they honor me with their mouths. Draw nigh unto me, near, with their mouth. Honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. They can be shouting and, oh, wonderful Jesus. And the minute you say, are we supposed to obey? Oh, the whole face changes. That's done away with. And they don't mean that. They don't want to do away with thou shalt not steal. No, 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 no. They scared you to steal from them. They don't want to do away with thou shalt not kill. They don't want to do away with thou shalt not commit adultery. They don't want to do away with one God. Don't worship idols. They don't want to do away with thou shalt not lie. They don't want to do away with honor your father and your mother. They have Mother's Day and Father's Day and now Grandmother's Day. They don't want to get rid of the law. There's only one that bothers them. And for that one, they're willing to throw it all away. And that is the fourth one that says, keep the Sabbath holy. And all that shouting... All you got to do is tuck at the sleeve and say, are we supposed to keep God's commandments? And you see everything, and the shouting stops. Let me read it. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And men decided with a vote at a council of Laodicea in the 4th century A.D., the Roman church voted the Sabbath out, voted Sunday in, the commandments of men, and religion is vain in spite of the hallelujahs. I, Jesus said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. No light. Not part right, part wrong. No light in them. Isaiah 8, 20. Now, all right, pastors, stop the conundrum. Where is this church? If you're not going to say it's yours, where is it? Revelation 12 and verse 17. And this is what the Bible says. Revelation 12. And verse 17, and the dragon, now I'm not going to confuse you. You're going to know what every bit of this is. Verse 9 says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So let's go back to verse 17. And the dragon, that's the devil, was wroth, angry, with a woman, the symbol of the church. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What is a remnant? Last part. They have remnant sales for ladies who like to sew. 
And you go in there and you pay five dollars a yard for cloth, but if there's a remnant, you might get it for two fifty a yard. It's the last that's left. It's the same color as the first piece. If the first piece is silk, the remnant is silk. If the first piece is wool, the remnant is wool. Ladies, am I telling the truth? And the dragon, the devil, was wroth, angry, with a woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That woman's mentioned up in the very first part of the same chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. Clothed with the sun, the gospel of Christ, he has risen, that is the sun, the hope has come. What's the moon under her feet? Ceremonial law that's passing away. Would you say amen? amen? By the way, the moon doesn't have any light, it reflects the light of the sun. The ceremonial law couldn't save anybody, it simply reflected the hope and promise of Jesus. This woman is clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Those are the twelve apostles. And she being with child, uh, cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. And his tail drew down the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. Herod sent soldiers to kill the innocents in Bethlehem. It's all here. That's the woman. That's the early church with the 12 apostles. But when you get down to the end of time, the disciples are dead. And we've gone through all of this period. And now John sees the remnant, that which is left. And by the way, just like a remnant cloth, it's the same color and the same material. The last church will be like the first. If the first church kept the commandments, the last church will keep it. If the first church was obedient to God, the last church will be obedient. And now let me read it to you. And the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed, which, here is your identifying mark, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And Jesus said, in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, but the remnant church will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What in the world is that? Revelation 19, 10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the remnant church will keep God's commandments and believe in the writings of the prophets. God wrote the law, prophets wrote everything else, they were inspired, and the remnant church will be close to God's word and close to God's law because they love Jesus. Would somebody say amen? amen. amen. How to choose a church? You got to find one that keeps the commandments of God and everything they teach based on the word of God. And until you do that, you haven't found the right one. I want to go to the screen now. The lights will come down. My projectionist is ready. Let's review and look at this thing together. It is a pitiful thing to choose a church because it's pretty. When Jesus started his church, they didn't have a building. They didn't have a piano. Didn't have an organ. Didn't have a choir. Didn't have padded pews. They went into the upper room. But what they did have was the Holy Ghost. I tell you the truth sincerely. I'd rather worship God under a tree than to worship in error in a cathedral. Pastor James Washington sits on this rostrum with me and participates in our program. He's a pastor here. The last time I think I had seen him before I saw him here was in uh, Eastern Kenya in a town called Niamira. He drove me in a van and others. The highway was so slick, I compared it to lard on ice. The van turned every way. We got stuck numerous times. And frankly, I wanted to go back because I don't believe in being late. Pastor Washington said, Pastor, let's just go on. And when we finally reached Niamira on that dirt road, having been pushed out of ruts and uphill and down, I'm looking to the left. And I heard somebody said, look at that. And I turned and 6,000 people were sitting on the ground in a light drizzle. 
waiting on me to talk about Jesus. I got so filled up, I couldn't even talk. They were so orderly. The little ones were in the front, the youth were in the middle, and the older ones formed a semicircle, and concentrically they surrounded that little place where the loudspeaker was. Pastor Wright had baptized 4,600. The day that I preached, 120 came forward. There were churches there, but they'd rather be outdoors in spirit and in truth. And don't you think they were sitting out there with lion skins? They were dressed like you were dressed. And their clothes were damp. And amongst them, we had dinner that day, Pastor Washington, at the home of the principal of a school. Amongst them were city fathers and professors and professional people in Niamira, Kenya. And we get married to a building. And you forgive me, I don't want to get distracted here. I want you to read this with me. I don't mean out loud. I want you to see it. I think it comes in closer. What in heaven's name are the church of the four-leaf clover, the church of the fuller concept, the psychedelic Venus church, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. 1187 churches. You better know how to choose. Satan is concocting a milieu of deception and he'll put enough good in it, like I poured a orange juice first, and then the poison to sink you. You better know how to shoot. You better know how to pray too. I said you better know how to pray too. Pray that you will have spiritual perception. So you can't go by the building, how pretty it is. One church taught universally that black folk didn't have souls and couldn't go to heaven. And then we passed a civil rights law and they got a vision that we could be saved. And they went into an island full of black people and built the two prettiest churches on the island and how it attracted everybody. That's one of our churches over at the Andrews University, but uh, you don't go by that. I wouldn't. It's too serious. That's the inside of it. Too serious, beloved. Too serious. There's another great, magnificent building. Oh, I've been there. They've got, I don't know if I've been in there. I've been in the tabernacle next door. But you've got to have more than that. Listen. The Bible says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ has a church, and you've got to look for it. And if you do, he'll help you find it. Christian unity is Christ's desire. He said he wants us to be one. And he prayed it in John 17. He said that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Unity is evidence to the world that Jesus is really the Son of God. Now, I wouldn't have any faith in a Christ that said you can join, but you can keep on smoking and drinking and going to these wild shows. And you can watch anything on your VCR. If, if, if Christ said that, that's no testimony to me. Jesus wants us to be one. Whether in a little church or a big one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Beloved, he said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. They shall hear my voice. And there shall be what? I was out riding one day in Palestine, and that's the only section where sheep are still led by the shepherd. 
I was in New Zealand, and I've seen, I was told, 50,000 sheep in one area. And they got dogs to drive them, and the dogs literally run on their backs. And the man comes along in a jeep, they are driven. But in the Middle East, they still lead the sheep. Jesus is not going to drive you. He leads you. And finally, we came to a scarce watering hole. And I was told all these sheep gather there and they fill the troughs one after another and they water the sheep. But they're all different flocks. And I said to my guide, when the shepherd gets ready to go, after he has eaten his bread, his falafel, after he has dipped it in oil and he's ready to go, how does he separate his sheep from all the others? I'll never forget it. He said, oh, pastor, that's easy. When a shepherd is ready to go, he walks out a little piece, a pot, and he puts his hand up, and he gives a little call. And every sheep knows that shepherd's voice and comes out of the crowd. Would somebody say amen out there? Jesus said, I got sheep in all of these folds, but I'm one shepherd, and they know my voice. When I call, how does he call? He calls through his word. And my sheep will come out of the crowd when they hear my voice and follow me. And there's going to be one shepherd. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you. That ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There it is. Ladies and gentlemen, if we got to the Bible, and the Bible only, we would all join hands together as Christians around the world. The thing that separates us is the traditions of men and the commandments of men. So the Word of God must be our guide. And when we find it, we'll find Jesus, we'll find his death for our sins, we'll find his resurrection, we'll find his high priestly ministry, and we'll find him saying, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If we believe the Bible and the Bible only, there will be sameness amongst God's people. Every time, Jesus said, I've got a church. And I want you to notice where it is. I've identified it. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There it is, Revelation 12, 17. Now I know that's clear. I know it is. Wherefore by their fruit shall you know them, not by their proclamations. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? There is a conflict here. And Christ articulates it so that there is no need to misunderstand. Even a child can understand that. That's what Jesus has done. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. To the law and to the testimony. To the law. Testimony. As a word, testimony again, the testimony of the prophets, the writings of the prophets. If they violate this, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light. Didn't say part light. There's no light in them. Isaiah 8:20. Yes, Jesus is master. Lord and Savior to them who are willing to love him and keep his what? John 14 and verse 15. Yes, he's got a church and you must choose. Now I want to close. I think I'm there. Yes, here we go. It's not the biggest church. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. In a ye in at the straight gate for Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Anybody here interested in going to destruction? Jesus said that gate is wide and broad and easy. 
But the way to eternal life is straight and narrow, and F-E-W, what does that spell? Few there be that find it. Jesus told a parable that I want to close with. He said a woman had ten pieces of silver, and she lost one. She didn't lose them all, she lost one. Jesus made a great and magnificent lesson from this. I would ask you, what, if the woman represents the church, what did she receive in a denomination of ten? The Ten Commandments. So I can think of ten precious pieces of silver and one was lost. And Jesus said, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 17 to 19, whosoever therefore shall break one. How many? One. Of these least commandments. And teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Here is the woman, the church, lost one of ten. I've had people say to me, Pastor, why do you emphasize the Sabbath so much? I tell them the Sabbath is not more important than thou shalt not steal. You can try to keep Sabbath and steal, you're going to hell anyhow. They are of equal importance. Then why do I stress it? Because she only lost one. She had nine. No point in me stressing all the others when all the other churches who claim the law was nailed to the cross believe in nine. I stress the one that she lost. And Jesus said that that woman who lost one piece doth light a candle. What is that? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light under my path. If you want to find what was lost, you got to light the candle. You got to get the word of God. It is the lamp. And then she sweeps. I can see her sweeping through Phoenix. Looking for that lost piece of silver. How to choose a church? She's trying to find one. And she sweeps past some magnificent stained glass windows. She sweeps on past some terrific choirs. She sweeps on past some professional organists. She sweeps on past the magnificent vestments worn that impress people's soul. She just keeps on sweeping. Why does she sweep past? She's trying to find that one. And she's sweeping on the Sabbath. Trying to find it and they all locked up. Finally, she comes down Flower Street. Where I'm going to be preaching this coming Sabbath. <laughs> and she said, look here. I, I think I found something. Everybody's got nine, but I'm looking for the one lost. And when she finds it, the Bible says, she told her friends, come and rejoice with me. For that which is lost is now found. I have found the truth. I have found the light. Come on and say amen. Out there. amen. Rejoice. Rejoice. I've been preaching here now nearly three complete weeks. And you should have confidence now. Not necessarily in me. You don't have to do anything for me. Some of you will never see me again. But in the Word. In the Word. In the Word. And you've got sense. And you are held responsible for the Word. All of these extra things I say, forget it. But the word, the word, the word. You are responsible for the word. And if you want to know what you're supposed to do, light the candle, get in the book, and find the foundation of every doctrine that is taught. And when you find it, choose. I want to pray for somebody tonight. I want to pray for somebody who means business. Some folk come out here just to look at me. Some come just to hear pastor sing. Some come for all kinds of reasons. But I wonder who came because they are hungering and thirsting for the truth. Anybody out there like that? Then stand up now. Stand up now. Stand up for Jesus. Because you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice. 
you will be eternally responsible for every truth you have learned. Almighty God, I prayed before we came in here that you'd come by here, Lord. Come by here, and I have felt the stately steppings of the Holy Ghost. And these people have too, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I ascribe to myself the prerogatives of God or take credit for what God does. Now, Jesus, do these folk mean it standing like this? Or maybe I should ask them, do you all mean it if you do say amen? amen. Let heaven know that you are saying amen. Say it again. Amen. Lord, you heard it. I'm asking you to judge them. And I know you love them. You've even put it in my heart to love them. But we're nearing the end of this meeting. And I cannot leave this city without delivering my own soul. Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, seal every decision. Claim these as thine own. Have mercy, Lord. Where we are weak, be our strength. Where we are filthy, be our purity. Where we are blind, be our way, truth and light. Save us, Lord. Please, please, save us. Save us, Lord. When that trumpet sounds in that great getting up morning and the saints of all ages ascend the skies and the thundering tread of the righteous shall be heard sweeping through the gates into the city. You've written somewhere, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in. When they enter in, Lord, we want to be in that blood washed army. Don't we, folks? Please save us, Lord. Save us from tradition, from deception, from sentimentalism. Save us, Lord. In Jesus' name. There is someone who cares. Just find his remnant fold. There is someone who cares without is dark and cold. There is someone who cares. Go where only truth is told. Well, that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares, and his word must be supreme. There is someone who cares. Tradition is the devil's scheme. There is someone who cares about you. Join his obedient team for that someone who cares is Jesus.